This is the Ultimate Dallas Sports Show, sponsored by your North Texas Chevy dealers. Together, let's drive. And with that, we welcome you inside episode number two of the Ultimate Dallas Sports Show, your weekly destination for opinions on the sports topics that matter most to you. Spinoff of our sister show, the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. And as we have all learned through the decades, if you want to do something right in the sports world, be like Cleveland. <laughs> So here we are. Mike Leslie, Andrew Seeley, our esteemed panel on their way here momentarily. A great day, a great sports week, Andrew, to look back upon. Uh, for sure, and it obviously has to start with the Masters, which we'll get into. But at least mm. when you're looking at the schedule, I mean, Masters, Mavs, and Rangers, it looked like a great day. Would have thought. Uh, sure, but Scheffler taking over the uh, spotlight certainly mm. made for interesting viewing. So what is on the show today? Well, let's kick it off with what's on the show sponsored by NFM. As we mentioned, got a lot to get to. Masters just wrapped up. It is a destination event for sports fans. So actually, we're going to break down the best sports venues on all of our collected bucket lists. The Mavs are ready to start their playoff run. But what's the deal with Luka not getting any MVP buzz? It seems like that's the buzz around it that he's not getting the attention. Plus, the Rangers have already played seven games against the Astros. The big question there, why do we still need human umpires? This is not an Angel Hernandez specific question. And last but not least, mostly, are, mostly. And last but not least, we're switching it up this week. I got a top five for you. The top five most magnetic athletes of the 21st century. That is what's on the show, Mike. Now who's on the show? Yeah, Andrew, we got a couple of ticket tier one hosts with us. St uh, Sports Sturm himself, Bob Sturm from the Hardline. Sean Bass, of course, from the new midday show, The Sweet Spot on the Ticket. And from the Locked On Mavs podcast, Nick <laughs> Engstadt with us as well. Sturm, I know you're coming off of a trip to Augusta this week you were there for uh, the first couple of days Monday Tuesday all of us are jealous of you for that w what was that like for you it was unbelievable it was honestly I've I've waited a long time to uh, to get to Augusta I never really thought it was going to work out for me and and then you get there and I, I I think I would describe it as something like going to a Hall of Fame where the players in the Hall of Fame are actually still playing and you can see them all around you and all the Hall of Fame holes around you. So it, it was exactly, well, actually it was probably more than I, than I thought it was going to be. It was, it was unbelievable. So with that, let's, let's cast this out to the panel. And Sean, I'll come to you first. What's the best event you've been to, best event, best venue you've been to, and what's the thing still on your bucket list that you need to check off? And I think for a lot of us, it, it may be Augusta. But Sean, for you first. I was in Madison Square Garden a couple of weeks ago to see a Knicks game, and that was really cool. Lambeau in December to see a Cowboys Packers was incredible. But the one place I want to get to before I'm in the ground, that's the All England Club at Wimbledon. I would love to spend like a couple days just see all the courts, take in the strawberries and cream, maybe deck myself out in white. I don't know. <laughs> How about you, Nick? What's the best one you've been to and the one you still need to check off? Yeah, the best sports venue I've ever been to is the uh, the Roman Coliseum in Italy. This is a rock I got from there, and it's an amazing uh, historic place where they did used to have lots of sporting events, very historic. But uh, best place I've probably ever been to, the Chase Center in, uh, in Golden State, just a, an amazing, huge venue that they created out there for the Warriors. And, Bob, how about for you? I mean, I, I know you just checked off a big one anyway. Is there something still left on the list for you? You know, honestly, I've been pretty lucky here stateside, uh, and, and, and so uh, in the last couple of years, I made it to U.S. Open Tennis and, uh, and then to Augusta this week, so, so I actually am going to uh, give Sean dittos there. I, I, I wanted mm. to say Wimbledon myself. I've been there for a tour, but I've never been there for uh, the event itself, so I, I, I would also love to see Wimbledon. I think the coolest one for me, I've been to a Final Four, been to a Super Bowl. I think I actually put the Final Four above the Super Bowl, believe it or not. I think that had to do more with the games and the environment. It was at Lucas Oil Stadium, so it didn't have the same cachet maybe as some other Super Bowls might. Um, I think for me, the one I do still need to get to is Augusta. That, that's got to be at the top of the list. I'll throw Fenway in there, too, just from You're the about atmosphere. To check that one off, though. I hope so. I hope so. Barring weather and yeah. barring some difficulties with travel, hopefully Fenway will get checked off pretty soon. But right. uh, as long as Lambeau gets represented, that's all I care about here. <laughs> Big Packers fan. You'll learn about his so sports I, fandom over the course we'll of time, there. I promise you. We'll get there. With that, let's uh, perfect segue. Let's talk Mavs with the Nuggets fan. <laughs> So let's get to it. Uh, obviously, Mavs Clippers series is set up. Series will start a week from today in L.A. But the conversation that has consumed Mavs Nation over the course of the last week and a half, two, three, however long, 
is Luka Doncic's candidacy for MVP. Yeah, Nick Angstad, our, our Locked On Mavs host, let's start with you. Do you think there's any actual pathway for Luka to win the award? I don't think that Luka has a chance to get into it. I think second is now the conversation for him between him and SGA. I think Jokic just is going to have it. His advanced stats have been insane this season. The Nuggets have been very good until they just lost to the Spurs the other night and ruined their chance to get the one seed. But uh, And I think that a lot of voters look at last season and go, man, we really should have voted Jokic instead of Embiid. And then they go, well, let's just give it to him this year. And it's very weird that the MVP has kind of become about that. Sean Bass, how about for you? You think this has uh, gone the way that it should, the way that an MVP discussion should? Yeah, I have no issue with Jokic being the MVP again. I mean, like you said, the numbers are there. He's on a team that tied for first place in the West. I think they have the inside track to maybe win another title, or at least the team from the West that could win another championship. And Lucas' case is great. 39-9-9. and nine. That's never – or excuse me, 33-9-9. and nine. That's never been done before. But it feels like, like what Nick said, the MVP is – always you're handed the MVP the next year after you do something great. I think there was some precedent with that with Dirk. And like, like last year, I really thought Jokic should have been the MVP. They gave it to Embiid, which is fine. Just like this year, if they give it to Jokic over Luka, that's fine too. As long as Luka wins one in the next few years, I think that's what really matters for his legacy. Yeah, the issue here is not Jokic's candidacy. His candidacy is obviously legitimate, but it, it's such a narrative-based award. Bob, you and Sean especially, and Nick for that matter, I mean, you, your your career is, is narrative-based in some form or fashion, so is ours. Did the Mavs jump on this train too late? Was it was just their, their surge too late? What, what, why is this not more of a discussion? And what, what seems like, from a statistical standpoint, a very narrow gap, but the odds makers yeah. would tell you it's huge. To me, it's not even an award about who is, in fact, the most valuable player in the NBA. It, it, it is, in fact, uh, you know, a... A, a weave of narratives that go on for years at a time. And, and I really think this is the year where Luca gets back in the good graces of the voters. And, you know, he's not uh, James Harden light. He's not a, a stats guy on a bad team. So he's kind of rebuilding his credibility this year, as goofy as that is. You know, a lot of people bet against the Mavs and uh, their desperation with Kyrie and just all these things that everyone just goes with and believes. So he's absolutely having an MVP year, but he also absolutely had no chance to win it with the voters because they'd already sort of made up their minds. So I think he has set the table for next time around, but it's like, you know, winning an Oscar for the fifth best film you've ever done. It's just, it, 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 it's kind of goofy in the end, but it also seems to push as much conversation as just about anything about in the NBA these days. He's got a really good chance to win it next year at the very least. If nothing else, he has set the table for 2025 if he goes out there, Andrew, and performs well. I think the, the one reality we'll have to get into, though, is Jokic is about to be a three-time MVP, which mm -hmm. kind of puts him in rarefied air in terms of his legacy and what, how we think of centers in the NBA and their current status. But that's obviously a fascinating discussion. We'll have to get into it another time. Uh, Nick, sit tight. We will see you in a bit. First thing, though, when we come back, we're talking Rangers. Stay with us on the Ultimate Dallas Sports Show, sponsored by your North Texas Chevy dealer. Today's headlines, sponsored by your North Texas Chevy dealers. Scotty Scheffler pulls away from the field to win the Masters for the second time in his career. The Mavericks are set to open their playoff run in L.A. against the Clippers next Sunday. And the Rangers drop the finale of their series with the Astros 8-5. Welcome back to the Ultimate Dallas Sports Show. Rangers and Astros are now done with their first two series of the year. And not a great week for the Rangers, Mike. No. No, you lose a series to the A's, you lose a series to the Astros, who it seems early on this season can only beat the Rangers. The, the, <laughs> everybody else they're struggling with. Bottom line, the AL West is not very – Two weeks into a very long baseball season, Fair. but the AL West is not great to start this season. Especially for some preseason favorites, um, more specifically. I mean, granted, I mean, the Rangers have shown some, some life, but mm. more importantly, guys, what do you think about the way the Rangers have started this season? Is there enough good counteracting the bullpen issues I think everyone seems to be talking about? Yeah, I think it's been a decent start offensively. Now, this past week was a little slow, but you've seen what they can do. I mean, just Friday night scoring 12 runs in Houston and – even with your starting corner infielders out, there doesn't really feel like there's a break or a big break in this lineup right now. And you get those guys healthy, Lowe will be back in a few weeks, you, you presume. It's going to be a little while on Josh Young, but 
this team can put the ball in play. They can make good starting pitchers work. And uh, the 500 record isn't ideal. Losing, uh, what, four out of seven to Houston, also not ideal. But if you can just get through all these injuries and keep scoring runs, the schedule will lighten up too because the the April slate has been really tough. If you look mm. at some of the teams that are going to play this week, Detroit's no slouch. They're going to take on the Reds later this month. It's not going to be all that easy to stay over 500 here in April. Bob, for you, I mean, we've seen the Rangers scuffle a little bit out of the break. We've seen the, the Astros scuffle in a big way with the exception of this weekend series. Who should be more concerned by the, the start of their 2024? Oh, I imagine the Astros, but only slightly. You know, I mean, it, it, it's it's baseball, and that's the fun thing about uh, a postseason run is that we sort of start equating it to football in terms of the uh, ramifications of every result. Uh, this yeah. is a must-win game tonight, and, oh, the next one's a must-win game too. Now we're back in the cadence of April. We're back uh, in the 162-game uh, uh, long, long marathon, and uh, you know a couple, a couple rough uh, series in, in in early to mid April uh, should not uh, upset anybody. You know, stay alive, stay in it, stay competitive. This team is obviously good enough to do all those things, and uh, and and see where you are once uh, once we start actually getting ready for football again. So you know that I, I have a hard time <laughs> stressing about uh, games in yeah. April. I guess is what I'm going to say. Eight and eight through 16 games, basically one sixteenth of, excuse me, one tenth of the season to this point. You're not even, you're at what, halftime of game two of the Cowboys season <laughs> when you compare the two in terms of the percentage of the season we are through for the Rangers. So yeah, there's, there's not a whole lot to, to get two up in arms in at this point. The one thing that irritated a lot of people on Friday night, though, was the umpire behind the dish. And I know this is something, Andrew, you really wanted to get into because there was a lot that was questionable about the way that all transpired. I know this is going to eventually turn into an Angel Hernandez discussion. And we've had this discussion in many forums over the last decade plus of mm -hmm. his time behind the plate. But why are we allowing umpires to make these egregious mistakes and affect games to the level that they were at? Specifically with that game, it was an 8-2 game at the time. Uh, Wyatt Langford, the base is loaded, struck out on three balls so far off the plate, they might as well have been in Oklahoma. <laughs> and at the same time, like I, I know we're kind of joking about this is April, this is the, the early part of the season, and yet that affected, I'm sure, the Astros' chances of getting back in the game. That affected how Bochy then used his bullpen for the remainder of it. And you don't know how that might have trickled down and affected the rest of the series when at the end of the season we're talking about a one- or two-game difference between the Rangers winning the division outright or going on the road for the entirety of their playoff run. So the larger question for me is, why are we still letting human error affect things like strike zones, like foul tips, which you saw in the opener? What's the deal here? I'm absolutely right there with you on this. I, I've always found the the idea that uh, you know good is is not the enemy of perfect is is a way we are navigating these sports and so uh when we talk about instant replay for some reason the enemies of technology uh helping these guys get a little bit better at jobs they're not very good at seems to be held to the standard of if it's not perfect then we're upset about it. Uh, the replay system in all these sports, I know the English Premier League has trouble with it. The NFL has trouble with it. So baseball resists and, you know, they they uh, deduce it down to robots running the game. And, and uh, you know, the, the human element is why we all fell in love with this game. Doggone it. Getting the call right is is why we, we, we hold this sport and every sport to the level that it's got to be at least as good as we can see on television on our couch. And, and and so uh, I, I absolutely advocate, you know, even the tennis challenge system, which I know the minor leagues are working on, where you can just challenge a call. We go to the to the uh, screen, and if it's in the if it's in the square, it's a strike. This isn't that hard. Uh, baseball is always resisting, kicking and screaming, and I just think this is a, a a real easy choice to make. And it was about 30 years ago too. Well, a big reason that Angel Hernandez still has a job is the MLB umpires have a very strong union. And I don't think you're going to see a day where there's no umpire behind the plate and they just go full no. automated. I do love the challenge system, which is getting better and better in the minor leagues. And I'm guessing we'll eventually implement that. But my only slight worry about having an automated strike zone is it feels like right now 
we have all these pitching injuries with dudes having to stress throwing as hard as they can, max effort all the time, try to get as much spin on the ball as they can, and that is a weapon to counteract the hitters right now. If you go full automated strike zone and you don't have an umpire calling an inch or two or three outside the strike zone, just to give the pitcher a little something to help his cause, I feel like it could tilt the game in a way that we're not really thinking about. I think the hitter is going to have a huge advantage if we go to an eagle eye type system. Is that think, uh, following the uh, same uh, path as, as other sports? Is that what baseball might want? A more offensive game because so many other sports are making tweaks to make it more offensive. Do they ultimately maybe want that? I think ideally they probably to. want that, but when you have a pitch clock that's already made games very digestible, I'm just worried that we're going to see a ton of walks and managers are going to just go through their pitching staff like crazy. I think you should maybe expand pitching rosters. That would definitely yeah. help, especially some of the injury issues here. I'm just, th I'm just imagining a system where a pitcher won't get a corner and that's going to dramatically affect their outing and it's not going to make it the best possible product, even though everybody thinks it will yeah. be. I Bob might be on an there. island here. It just seems to me like the strike zone, uh, it, I, I don't think we would see a ton of walks, Sean, because the strike zone, as it's written in the rule book, is from the letters to the knees. I mean, it, we've we've never seen that. The strike zone in Major League Baseball feels like a dinner plate at times, maybe a, <laughs> maybe a pizza pan. And if they actually called it like it should, it, it, it should benefit the pitchers. Uh, I think you would have so much more space. It, it would be interesting to see them actually enforce the strike zone as it's written, because I don't think I've ever seen that in my lifetime. No, and you go back to the 90s when Maddox and Glavin were painting corners. They were getting a very liberal wide strike zone by the umpires, and those are guys that threw in the low 90s, and they didn't have to overpower people. But if we have a true strike zone, I worry that you're going to have so many pitchers feeling, man, I got to blow this right past this dude, so I'm going to just go max effort, and it's the third inning trying to throw 97. When if it was a slightly wider strike zone or you had a few corners that you were given, maybe you can throw 92 or 93 and preserve your arm. That's my only real issue with uh, having a, a fully automated strike zone. The good thing is, is like you're saying, Sean, they're at least testing some of these things in minors. Right. So we're, we're starting to see that the, the, sea, the sea change here. And, and at some point, we're going to see this improve. More of the Ultimate Dallas Sports Show coming your way after this. The top five, we return. All right, welcome back to the Ultimate Dallas Sports Show. Time for some fun and games. This time, we're doing a top five. All right, so the genesis of this, Caitlin Clark just wrapped up her collegiate career by driving in some of the biggest ratings we've ever seen in the history of basketball. So tonight, I'm giving you the definitive list, the top five most magnetic athletes of the 21st century. This means style of play, tune-in factor, general charisma, all of the above. Again, feel free to critique or throw my list under the bus if you can. We'll start with number five, and this is the only basketball player on this list. I will preface this by saying that Stephen Curry, we're talking impact on the game is obvious, but more importantly, viewership. I know we just had the discussion about Caitlin Clark. However, Curry also had a run at Davidson, and Clark's career is still currently in the early stages. And since 2015, only 27 NBA games have drawn more than 14 million viewers. Curry has played in all 27. He moves the needle. His style of play is dynamic. He deserves to be on this list. I wouldn't argue that at all. Steph Curry is absolutely box office. He's must-see TV. He has been for like a decade. My argument might be that you only have one basketball player on here, but I will let you finish. But all right, we'll move on to number four, and th this one's a personal favorite. Uh, number four is Michael Phelps. Accolades speak for themselves. More importantly, it's the drama of each individual race. He also defined the sport and more importantly, swam against the people that watched him growing up, which is saying something. So this is where you guys probably need a little bit of behind the scenes. High school swimmer here. So College that's... swimmer. Okay. Excuse you. All right. I'm, I'm, Excuse you. I'm, I'm, I'm still I'm masters, under, by I'm the way. Playing. 20 yeah. years worth um, of the time in the water, which may have affected my brain. The chlorine is no joke. I'm just saying. So that, that's that's the necessary context here is he's going to be more prone than the average to put a swimmer on his list. However. But Phelps is Phelps. I, he's not on my list, but he's, he's probably not too far off my list. So, okay. You, you, anybody running so a foul Olympic of Michael Phelps? On the list? Huh? I don't think he's in my top 100. <laughs> not top 100? <laughs> what? 
Oh my you're, god. You're, you're, you're the swimmer in the room, man. I, you're, listen, you're, gonna, you're not going to get a whole lot of support here. Number three, uh, we just saw him come stateside. Lionel Messi. I don't think anybody would argue with his impact specifically on, on the American soccer scene the instant he stepped foot here, but most popular player, most dynamic player arguably in the most popular sport in the world, obviously a needle mover in many more ways than one, deserves to be on the list. He's not on my list. He's, he's fantastic, but he's not on my list. Anybody else? He, he, might, be, he might be top three on mine. So okay, there you go. All going right. all you the got, way you've back. got some support finally. Congratulations. Going all the way back to Barcelona, <laughs> I, I, I've, I've tuned in specifically to see Messi 300 times probably. You know what? I'll take that. That, that, that. That's a win. Who's number two? That's a certificate of approval as far as I'm concerned. All right, uh, moving on to number two. May or may not surprise you judging by number four's pick, but his partner at most of the Olympics was Usain Bolt on the track and field side of things. I understand we may or may not have an Olympic discussion, but the world stopped and watched him run the 100-meter dash every single time he was up for it. And it didn't just stop at the Olympics. It was when he set the record in Berlin. He is must-see TV, electricity personified. Again, deserves to be on the list. This one I hate less because he is <laughs> he is electricity. Like I, I, I'm I'm actually going to include him in in my five. Okay, I, there I you don't go. I don't I don't dislike this one as much. That's something. I wouldn't put him over Messi though. I mean, Messi is an international star, as is Usain Bolt. But soccer is the world sport. I just have a hard time believing that Usain Bolt should trump anybody that in the top three. So who's number one on your list? Uh, number one, and I, I feel like this is a little bit redundant considering we just got done talking about the Masters, but the obvious choice here for me is Tiger Woods. He got me to care about golf as a kid. I feel like most kids fall asleep watching golf, at least most normal kids, and... Prior to 1997. Right, but, but I'm also sitting there saying, from a viewership perspective, Tiger was not in contention this weekend. We still have to mention him on television. What do you think of his five? Who would you put in your five? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Tiger and, and, and Steph Curry make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Messi, uh, is, is, I'm, I'm fine with. The Olympic athletes, you know, it's, it's, it's different strokes for different folks. But uh, when you talk about Patrick Mahomes, when you talk about Connor McDavid, when you talk about Ooh, hockey representation. Luka Doncic. So I, I would lean towards the basketball football world. But if you want to do swimming and track, that is totally <laughs> your list. And that's fine with me. The magnetism to me is more important for smaller sports because with football, you have a built in number that people are going to watch anyway. When the Jaguars and Titans move the needle enough compared to other sports, then what are we really talking about? They kind of move the needle. I'm, I'm with I'm you on saying, Woods. I've I'm got just saying. one. Curry, I'm cool I mean, with. Could... Bolt's fine. I do put Caitlin Clark on my list, and I think Mahomes has got to be on there. Bob, uh, final word to you. I, I was just going to say, we could check the Kansas City Chiefs game ratings when Matt <laughs> Castle was their quarterback and yeah. see how they compare to Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> I don't know. I'm Kansas thinking City... they might be better with Patrick Mahomes at quarterback. They were 10-6 and six at one point, though, and did make the playoffs. So, just saying. Anyway. Success uh, on the field, ratings, different conversation. All right. Anyway. Success? I think it's a success. I'm going to call it a success. Three out of five <laughs> minimum, 60%. It, it was okay. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Bob Sturm, Sean Bass, Nick Angstad, fellas, we appreciate your time. As always, thank you so much. We will be back with more of the Ultimate Dallas Sports Show after this. All right, welcome back to the Ultimate Dallas Sports Show. Time now for my final take. This show is going to be pretty light as we go along, but I'd be remiss if we didn't at least take this moment in this particular show and give a proper goodbye to the great Vern Lundquist. His final broadcast period. Today at Augusta National, after a 40-year career at Augusta, much longer than that for many of you who remember him here on these WFAA airwaves, going all the way back to Bowling for Dollars, sportscasts here on Channel 8, and much, much more. One-time voice of the Dallas Cowboys, the man did it all, but he was maybe most in his element behind 16 at Augusta National. Tiger Woods made a point to go say his goodbye to Vern Lundquist behind the 16th green earlier today as he played his final round there today. It was a, uh, it was a very special goodbye to one of the great, great sportscasters of many generations. Vern Lundquist, thank you for all of that from yes, sir, to oh my goodness, <laughs> and everything before and since. 
truly a special, special career and, and worthy of a proper goodbye. And they, it, it was cool to see them say goodbye to him today on, uh, on the broadcast there at Augusta National. Thank you guys so much for joining us here on the Ultimate Dallas Sports Show. For our swimming viewership, <laughs> both of you, thanks oh for watching. Oh, my God. For no, Andrew Seeley, I'm Mike no. Leslie. Good night, everybody. There are a lot of you. We know. Get back on the This has been the Ultimate Dallas Sports Show, sponsored by your North Texas Chevy dealers. Together, let's drive.